Hi, I'm Durham Wong Rieger, President and CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, and really happy to speak with you today just to open it up on the question of why are we still debating open access to academic research? I mean, this is just a snapshot of what you can get when you go onto the websites looking for weight loss pills. These are all the ads that are there. You can see them on you know, all your different devices. You can certainly see them on television. And you can get access to real information around it, but obviously this looks a lot less exciting than the stuff you might get through some of the other more promotional kinds of products. This is, again, just a really quick snapshot. This was something I thought was kind of interesting. You know, actually, anti-vaccination ad mysteriously appears at, appears at a New York City bus stop and almost looked like the real thing, and people actually looked at it. This is, again, you can get real information, but sometimes not as easily accessible, and in some cases, maybe not nearly as uh, as appealing. This is just a little demonstration that, in fact, when we look at the anti-vaccine narratives that are streaming, what you see is that the majority, more than three quarters almost, are really anti-vaccine. And the others, in terms of in the more informational one or the f medical information, really is a lot less. So what we see is that if patients, public, can't get access to good published medical research, they really are going to be reliant entirely on what is available through other portals. And what are the reasons why patients can't access? Many of themselves, and certainly my experience as well, it's hidden behind what we call paywalls, right? Subscriptions, single cost of use. I just did one yesterday and it said for 50 bucks, I can read this for 24 hours. I'm going like, okay. Journals aren't available. Even when I can get to the academic library, a lot of those journals are not available in our libraries. I go into a, a public portal and it really just gives me the abstracts only on the journal portals. And in some cases I can get them, but it's online read only. So you can read it and hopefully you can take notes and maybe you can screenshot part of it, but it's not long-term accessible. Others, and I work in a very global environment as chair of Rare Diseases International, we get patients all the time telling us, I can't get access to information because it's in English only. And this is not just patients. These are healthcare professionals. These are other researchers. If you're not English fluent um, speaking, you don't get good access to this information. And in many cases, these English language journals aren't even available in the country. And the last thing that we hear over and over again, that even though when we get them, the articles are written at too high scientific or technical level. They really aren't written for the general public. Uh, even when they're plain language articles and summaries, they're not easily accessible. Not everybody has them. And sometimes the sad news is the PLSs look just like the uh, actual academic access. This is just a little slide to say, OK, do we get informed opinions or do we get risky misinformation if we get open access? Because quite frankly, in some cases, what we get are patients' res um, inability to actually interpret the information. And this leads to a real question of how much open access should there be? Should there be unfettered open access? Should there be some actual kinds of filters? Benefits of open access to medical information, I think we all know and we hear them over again from my experience as well. We we'll get more informed about the options. We're empowered to with up-to-date access to what information. We can take them into our clinicians or we can take them into other kinds of policymakers. Most important thing, I think, is it builds trust. Even if you can't get it all, even if you don't understand it all, the fact that you can get access to it and you can get somebody else to help interpret it and you know you've got the data behind it really does promote trust. And it also, in the long term, of course, engages patients more, especially in things like clinical trials and more and more toward the willingness to engage in long term monitoring and really recognizing why you have to do that because the knowledge base is important. So it helps us, obviously, to engage with other patients, build communities. And this is something that we haven't done well, but we should, is we need to have patient communities that are absolutely facile with the information to support and help interpret for each other. And, of course, at the end of the day, it really hopefully will improve health, reduce the overall cost, and actually allow patients to participate in more informed ways with policies, with health groups, with hospital boards, whatever it is that we're participating in. Um, the downside, as we said before, is sometimes it's complex, difficult to understand. So how do we make it so the information is not only available, but it's truly accessible? Sometimes it takes a lot of background and knowledge. And that's up to us sometimes as a patient community to help interpret that, to provide either forums or other kinds of information that can back it up or have it on our own websites. 
Most important, I find a lot of times we can't recognize misinformation or even misinterpretation of the data, even from the peer review sources. And I know that because sometimes we're doing a review of these sources and we're saying, no, that's not the way. That's not what the data says. But it's really difficult. And especially if you're getting a lot of these data through so-called social media, how do you actually make sense of it? Uh, risk and COVID showed us that a lot of premature conclusions that are based on preliminary findings, people getting access to pre-publication documents, incomplete data. The sad part is that when you have to pull back a study, when you have to do a retraction, it shakes everybody's trust in it. So where's the balance between getting early access, getting access to things that are not yet totally reviewed, and also, and so, but it's more timely, but also the risk in that it will be misinterpreted or people don't understand why the reassessment was necessary. We want to, at the end of the day, to make sure we have equity for all those without a scientific background or sufficient health literacy. I keep hearing that we have to improve people's health literacy, maybe, but maybe we also need to make sure that we improve the information and the way it's presented that's more understandable of people who don't necessarily need to go through a course in data literacy or health literacy so that it can be used, make informed personal decisions, and to participate in informed policy discussion. Thank you.